For today, we start in about 10 minutes. Greetings, everybody. Start in a few minutes. There we go. There's James. Hey, James, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. How are you doing? Good, good. Can you give me one second here? Yeah, sure.
Okay. James, I want to show you something. Are you busy? Who, me? Yeah, let me show you something here. Uh, yeah, let me just, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, you see this number, 189? Mm hmm This is people that don't show up in the panel. Uh, these are people that come by and just watch the video on the website. That's not 189, but that's probably about one third the number that 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 watch this uh, webcast on my website. Okay. And don't and don't come in the panel. So you are reaching people. Oh, okay. So they're watching by coming through the web your website yeah the, yeah the, and it doesn't register on youtube doesn't register on anything but my counter okay on, on the website so be uh don't worry <laughs> uh, let's see here you ready to start uh give me a second i'm trying to find yeah. my talk here yeah, that's a good uh, point. <laughs> okay, I think I found it. Yeah, okay. I think I found it. Whenever yeah, you're yeah, ready. Yeah, hold on. I have one thing. Okay. Give me one second. Hello? Can you be here? I'm already in the hospital. Okay, because we're setting up your room. Okay. And I just want to let you know, um, so just be patient with our uh, there because the people the contact or the notice that's gonna be in the room is not really that good going on. Um if your your routine. Um, one of the other meds will be helping on the empty nurse, so uh, just let them know what to do. Oh, okay. What do you, when you, can Liz help? No, 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 can, no, no, Liz is my resident. Yeah, she can help. Oh, that, um, you can and so I okay. have to go in there. Yeah. We're going to go and do your case. Okay. Okay. So we're setting up, and I paid your residence. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, James. Okay. Okay. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from Miami Beach. Uh, we're doing another uh, in this series of with James Leo, uh, the the Art of Brain Surgery Masterclass, and this is the second series, and this is number three in a second series. And uh, we'll let James take over. Hello, James. Hello. Good morning. Thank you, John. Let me uh, share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you again, and uh, welcome to the Art of Brain Surgery Masterclass. Today's topic will be uh, on endoscopic endonasal transcribiform approach, and largely we use this for anterior skull-based tumors. So, the tumors of the anterior skull base, they've been traditionally treated with a transcranial approach, usually a, a bifrontal transbasal approach, and sometimes a craniofacial approach, 
for large tumors like this. This is an anesthesio neuroblastoma. And this is generally the zones of exposure that you can get through the anterior skull base using this type of approach, usually for an anterior fossa tumor that goes over the orbits. And, and often these tumors can invade and involve the sinonasal cavity. Uh, with the advent of endoscopic skull base surgery, uh, we're able to get to various portions of the ventral skull base. And we typically like to break it down into various corridors. So in the very anterior portion here, from the posterior table of the frontal sinus down to the cribriform and planum sphenoidale, we call this the transcribriform corridor. And for the supracellar region, the transplanum corridor. And as you move down below the pituitary, it's the transclival corridor to get to lesions in the clivus and in front of the brainstem. And then we can even get down to the cranial cervical junction and use the transodontoid corridor to remove C12 lesions or foramen magnum lesions. But today we'll focus on the um, transcribiform corridor. Uh, we can also go laterally out into the infratemporal fossa, middle fossa, and Meckel's cave cavernous sinus region for the lateral corridors. And again, today we'll focus here on this area of the transcribiform corridor, and uh, we'll go over the, the indications, the limitations, and uh, uh, operative nuances to set yourself up for success. So... What does this provide you? It, it provides you excellent visualization of lesions of the ventral anterior skull base. And in general, you're working corridors behind the posterior table of the frontal sinus out to the region of the planum sphenoidale. And uh, coronally, you're limited by the orbits. Uh, you have the lamina papricia, which is the medial wall of the orbits. And then in some cases, you can extend your approach and uh, work more lateral by removing more supramedial orbit. Um, but there are some disadvantages as you go out laterally, especially when it comes to repair. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later. But the wider the defect, the higher the risk of CSF leakage. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, what are the critical steps? Uh, generally, for a tumor like this, this is an anesthesia neuroblastoma. Uh, we want to debulk the tumor in the nasal cavity uh, up to the cribriform. And then with these cancers, we have to do uh, maxillectomies as well. So we open up the maxillary sinus, take out the uh, middle and sometimes inferior turbinate, open up the maxillary sinus, and we take the tumor up to the cribriform. And this is usually done with our ENT colleagues. Um, you want to remove the lamina papricia, uh, which is typically the involved bone uh, on the medial orbit here. And then we do a superior septectomy so that it allows us to work binostral and get access to the target. And then you have to really open up the frontal sinus. So if you look here on the sagittal MRI, here's the frontal sinus. You want to open it up widely and do what's called a draft three or a modified Lothrop frontal sinusotomy. And that's very important because when you open up that frontal sinus, it gives you a visualization of the posterior table of the frontal sinus. And what that posterior table does is it gives you a landmark of where the anterior limit of your resection will be but it also provides a surface area or a platform for your nasal septal flap to rest and make contact. And that's very important when it comes to reconstruction and preventing CSF leak. Once we set that up and you set the stage to expose your cribriform, you now drill the cribriform plate off. You ligate and divide the vasculature, namely the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries, and then you resect the anterior skull base dura and remove the tumor that's with it and any additional tumor that's intradural that needs to be separated from the brain. And then lastly, the last step is reconstruction to prevent CSF leak, usually in a multi-layered fashion with an extended nasoceptal flap. 
So those are the critical steps. Let's go over them. We typically use a 30 degree endoscope. We use a micro debrider or shaver. Sometimes you can use a, a Nico Myriad side cutting aspirator. You can also use a ultrasonic aspirator. Um, when you're working endoscopically, you want to use uh, extended transnasal burrs with a general curve to it so that you can reach uh, angles. Angled instruments are very important, angled scissors, curved suctions, and angled curettes. So this is a cartoon showing uh, what you'll see when you're removing the cribiform plate. Here's the frontal sinuses. You can see this is the posterior table of the frontal sinus, the crista galli, and the medial walls of the orbit. You take out the tumor, you're left with this defect, and uh, you have to be able to reconstruct it. So um, reconstruction is very important. We'll go over those uh, details in a moment. But this is the endoscopic modified Lothrop. You can see we've done a wide sinusotomy. Here's the crystal galley. Here's the posterior table of the frontal sinus. And again, this posterior table serves as a landmark of where the anterior limit of our drilling is going to be. So it's going to be right about here at the level of the crista. And then you have this posterior table of the frontal sinus uh, as a surface and landmark to make contact. You want to make sure your nasal septal flap rests on this ledge as you rotate it upwards. And so here again, this is another example. This was a uh, uh, sinonasal adenoid cystic carcinoma case. But you can see posterior table of the frontal uh, sinus. We resect the tumor here. And um, we now want to reconstruct. So the way we like to reconstruct this is uh, what we call a triple layer repair. We typically will use uh, autologous fascia lata as the initial layer as an inlay. Uh, sometimes we've moved from uh, fascia lata to just using alloderm. So the first layer is an alloderm or fascia lata inlay. And then the second layer is very important. The second layer is a uh, what we call a alloderm gasket or an alloderm combined inlay and outerlay. So the way this works is you put the alloderm here as an overlay, but it's oversized so that you then tuck gel foam along the wedges of it. So it kind of uh, performs like, like, like a gasket and it seals off this layer and it creates a plug. And once it creates a plug, we now rotate the last layer, which is our vascularized pedicle nasal septal flap. You can see it's quite a long reach because you need to make it reach all the way to the uh, posterior table of the frontal sinus. So you need to make sure that you contour your surface area of the flap just the right amount. We typically make our incision uh, well anterior in the nasal cavity. And if you harvest the flap along the floor of the nasal cavity, you can widen the surface area of the flap. And I'll show you some tricks on how to extend the length of the flap so that your flap will reach and it won't have any tension along the pedicle here. So here's an example. This is the case of that esthesioneuroblastoma. This is a complete removal. And you can see uh, this is the reconstruction. And then at three months follow-up, you could see the flap has nicely mucosalized. There's a nice enhancement of the uh, anterior skull base. You can see both orbits are nicely decompressed. Here's an example of uh, olfactory schwannoma. This is a pretty rare lesion, but uh, in any event, it kind of mimics a, a sinonasal malignancy. But this is one where you can see it's eroded into the left orbit. It's compressing the uh, medial rectus here. And so we did this through an extended endoscopic uh, transcribiform approach. You can see the tumors here in the nasal cavity. This is the uh, left uh, nasal cavity, the left inferior turbinate. Here's the left middle turbinate. You can see the tumor peeking itself out here. So we've debulked the tumor in the nasal cavity up to the cribiform plate. We would drill out the wide frontal sinusotomy, endoscopic lothrop, and then we resect the dura, 
And then you can see the tumor is here invading the cribriform plate. And then this is the repair. We did a fascia lata repair as the inlay. And then since the defect was small, we just did a double inlay and we use alloderm, a thick piece of alloderm, and it really fills the dead space here. And uh, lastly, you want to rotate the nasal septal flap. You can see it's a nice, nice repair. So here's the video showing the, the steps. We published this in Neurosurgical Focus back in 2012. Here we're showing new debulking of the tumor uh, in the nasal cavity. And um, we're working with uh, my ENT colleague here. This is Dr. Anderson Eloy. Uh, and um, once you debulk the tumor, you want to set the stage to expose the cribriform plate. So you can do all of this work in the nasal cavity with a shaver or debrider. And um, it's important to uh, you know follow the margins of the tumor. Uh, a lot of these tumors, they can uh, peel right off the nasal mucosa. And you can see this is nice, nice and smooth and encapsulated. So we'll go ahead and debulk this portion of the tumor. And then this is the ethmoid cavity. We're removing the tumor off the ethmoid. And then this is a curved uh, microdebrider. We're using a curved instrument because we're, we're approaching the frontal sinus. Uh, you can see we're taking the tumor out of the frontal sinus. And then here's the frontal sinus you can see. And so we're going to widen out that frontal sinus using some angled curettes and then a high-speed drill. This is our endoscopic Lothrop procedure. And then removing the, the debris. This is the, the looks like... Uh, um, pus or uh, trapped mucosal in the frontal sinus. This happens often with tumors that will obstruct the frontal sinus. And so here's the Lothar because it's widely opened. And now we're going to prepare ourselves. We're going to drill the curbiform plate here. And uh, we use a diamond drill here so you don't tear the dura. And then here is the uh, anterior ethmoidal artery. You need to coagulate this and divide it sharply because you don't want to avulse it and let the artery retract into the orbit. If that happens, you can get a retroorbital hematoma, and that can be a risk of visual loss from increased ocular pressures. And then we'll complete our drilling in a circumferential fashion using an angle cura to elevate the dura from the uh, uh, ridge of the cribriform plate. This part of the cribriform, this flat part is called the fovea ethmoidalis. So we've done a circumferential drill out, and now we want to open the dura. And I typically like to open the dura longitudinally on both sides first. So we make these uh, sagittally oriented cuts first. You can protect the brain with a small cottonoid patty. And um, we make our sagittal cut on the opposite side as well. So we're making two vertically oriented cuts in a rectangular fashion. So now we'll make our anterior cut and we'll use the angled scissors and go transversely. And here's where it gets tricky. You'll encounter the falks cerebri. And so when you make the cut on the falks, you want to cut anterior to posterior. It's uh, very easy to get lost and you start cutting superior all the way up to the vertex of the skull, but make sure you angle your scissors posteriorly. Another trick is to angle your 30 degree scope looking downwards, looking inferiorly, and this gives you a backwards look uh, towards the planum. And then here we uh, divide and ligate the olfactory tracts and then cut the Planum sphenodale dural attachment here at the at the end, and so there's a nice uh, tumor-free margin here in the back, and then here's the cribriform tumor that you could see, and this completes our uh, cribriform resection. So now we're left with the frontal lobes, as you saw in the cartoon. Uh, we'll put a little surge cell here for hemostasis. And then we'll do our repair. So here's our autologous fascia lotograph that was harvested. And we'll tuck this in as an inlay. 
you can see the fascia lata is a beautiful tissue for repair. It's got nice natural uh, healing properties. Uh, it's autologous tissue. We'll put a little surge cell there to hold it in place and uh, keep the bulk. And then for our second layer, we'll do an alloderm. And this is a, a thick, ready-to-use alloderm. It's, uh, it's a very nice material for uh, skull base reconstruction. And here the defect is small, so we're not going to do the alloderm gasket. We'll just tuck it in as an inlay, put a little surge cell. And the important thing before you rotate your nasoceptal flap is you want to make sure there's virtually no leaking of CSF. Because if you see leaking of CSF, the flap is probably not going to work. So you want to make sure there's really a good seal before you rotate the flap. Otherwise, you're going to have a failure of the repair. So you can see this flap fit very nicely. It's making contact with the posterior table, the frontal sinus. There's no tension on the pedicle. And we pack it with Surgicel gel foam and then a mirror cell pack, which we leave in for roughly uh, 10 to 12 days. Now for anterior skull base cribriform, we generally don't use lumbar drain. Uh, we think lumbar drain increases the risk of pneumocephalus by sucking air into the intracranial cavity. And if you don't use a lumbar drain, the CSF pressures will allow the frontal lobes to fall back down on the inlay of the repair and compress the repair from above. So for this corridor, we generally don't use a lumbar drain. Uh, here's an example. This is a patient with proptosis of the left eye. This was biopsied as a adenoid cystic carcinoma. Uh, you could see in the past when you, we saw a tumor like this involving the orbit, generally they would get a craniofacial resection with orbital exoneration, but we've changed the paradigm a bit in the sense that we try to preserve function as much as possible. So here we're going to do an um, uh, endoscopic medial maxillectomy. We've opened up the uh, maxillary sinus here. This is the maxillary sinus. The inferior turbine has been removed. This is the sphenoid sin, uh, coena. This is the sphenoid sinus. And now we're removing the tumor in the ethmoid cavity. And now we're opening up the frontal sinus here. And then we do a superior septectomy so that we have binostral access to the cribriform region. And now we're gonna drill off the cribriform plate. You can see we've drilled off the cribriform plate. Here's the dura. Here's the posterior table, the frontal sinus. So we'll go ahead and open up the dura as we shown you earlier in a sagittally oriented fashion. We'll cut the falx cerebri rotating the mic, uh, endoscope posteriorly. And you can see there's the olfactory tract. This has to go with the tumor. It's involved with the tumor. So these patients will invariably lose smell if they haven't lost smell already from the tumor. This is a cancer operation. So we have to be as thorough as possible. So here is the alloderm gasket. You can see we put a uh, alloderm wedged with gel foam. And before we put the nasal septal flap, uh, we're gonna open up the orbit. This is a tumor that's involving the orbit. And here you can see we developed a nice plane from the orbital fat, smooth encapsulated portion of the tumor. And uh, here's the tumor in the medial orbit that's been removed. And then once we remove that, we can now do our reconstruction and put up our nasal septal flap. So here's the final repair. This patient did quite well. You could see a uh, complete removal and a uh, nice reconstruction here. This is a uh, skull base uh, chondrosarcoma uh, of the anterior skull base. This was actually arising from the nasal septum and uh, was actually eroding the anterior skull base. So we were able to peel the tumor off of the anterior skull base and it was not eroding the dura. So this was completely extradural and uh, we got a complete removal and the patient has done quite well.
neurologically intact post-op. This case is a uh, sinonasal osteoblastoma in a child, very rare tumor. Uh, tumor was eroding up into the skull base and the orbit. It was entirely extradural. We were able to uh, remove all of this completely endoscopic. You can see we can remove the tumor that's in the frontal sinus. And um, this is the sagittal view showing the tumor here. And then you could see this is the uh, uh, this was completely uh, removed. This is um, this was a different case. This was another child. This was a uh, uh, aneurysm bone cyst of the anterior skull base. You could see it's quite extensive, and uh, we were able to peel it off of the dura and stay completely extradural. And uh, this was a complete removal of the tumor. You could see this is all extradural and uh, no CSF leakage. This is uh, another adeno uh, adenocarcinoma. This was uh, uh, involving and compressing the right orbit. And you can see we, with the endoscopic approach, we had a complete removal, resected the transcribiform plate. And here we have to do a repair. This is the nasal septal flap uh, showing the enhancement of the repair. And uh, this was a great outcome as well, no, no CSF leak. And there's the tumor. And the patient did quite well. So uh, let's talk about meningiomas for a moment. Uh, these are more controversial lesions. Um, typically, when they reach greater than four centimeters, the results aren't as good, namely because they grow wider along the anterior skull base, and often they involve uh, the anterior cerebral arteries that increases the risk of the surgery. And uh, again, the wider the defect, the higher the risk of CSF leakage, which has been reported to be up to 25% in the literature. So this one, in any event, we did this endoscopically. This is probably pushing the limit, but uh, this was a, a very challenging case. But you can see the tumor is within the limits of the corridor and with meningioma surgery, you debulk the tumor so that you can allow the capsule to collapse and to come around the tumor extracapsularly. And here's the tumor being debulked. And uh, you can see the defect was quite large, it was huge. And we were able to remove this tumor uh, extracapsularly. Here's the frontal lobes exposed. You can see a very wide dural defect a wide bony defect as well. So repair is very important. Um, here we did a, uh, a triple layer repair that I showed you, uh, fascia lata, the allodrum gasket, and then the end of na uh, nasal septal flap. So this is the allodrum gasket. We um, do a wide piece of allodrum and you wedge these pieces of gel foam underneath the edge of the bone of the skull base and it creates a, a natural plug. And you can see here's the triple layer repair. This is the defect. This is the fascia lata. This is the alloderm gasket. And then this is the nasal septal flap that we used. And at three months, you can see very nice mucosalization of the anterior skull base. And then here's the final, final view. You could see uh, an excellent uh, reconstruction and the patient did quite well. Uh, here's a more medium-sized tumor. This is probably more reasonable uh, uh, tumor to do endoscopically. This is uh, an olfactory group meningioma that was uh, 3.6 centimeters. Uh, and the important thing is you need to uh, ask the patient of what's their smell function. Uh, because if the smell function is intact, you, you should probably come from above and try to preserve olfactory function. Uh, in some people, um, olfactory is an important part of their profession. If they're a, a chef or a wine taster of that sort. Um, but in this case, the patient already had uh, smell impaired. And so this was a, a reasonable case to consider endoscopic. So there was no vessel encasement. It was not a broad-based tumor with lateral dural extension. So 
We did this one through an endoscopic approach, transcribiform corridor. Here we've done our uh, superior septectomy to allow us to work by nostril. And we set the stage to drill the cribriform plate. We've done a wide endoscopic lothra procedure. We're ligating the uh, posterior and anterior ethmoidal arteries. And then we're drilling off here the uh, cribriform plate. And then this is the crystal galley that we're drilling off. This is a this is like a anterior clinoid process almost analogous to. So we remove the crystal galley. We can cauterize the dura, which allows us to do early devascularization of the tumor. That's uh, very typical of meningioma surgery, early devascularization. And then we'll cut the falx cerebri here and then start debulking the tumor. So you can see the tumors right on the surface. It's very much like a convexity meningioma. And then after we debulk the tumor, we can start to dissect around the tumor, roll the tumor from the underlying frontal lobes, use some cottonoid patties to help our dissection and maintain our plane of dissection. And then we'll continue to uh, roll the tumor until it's freed. And once it's free, we can remove it. And then here's the final view of the cavity. This is the resection cavity of the frontal lobes. We'll put a little surgicel, an alloderm uh, inlay, and uh, we'll put a, a nasoceptal flap here. So here's the nasoceptal flap. Now, look how the flap retracts backwards. So there's tension on the flap, and you know this is probably going to fail. So we've developed this relaxing sphenoidal slit incision. So we make a little relaxing incision there without cutting the pedicle, but it releases the tension so we can pull the flap forward, and then it makes good contact without falling backwards. And then we put our surgicel, some gel foam, and um, it makes great contact with the anterior skull base for repair. And that is the final uh, post-op scan. So complete removal. And um, here's an example. This is a patient, you can see a patient has had a craniotomy here previously. This was an anterior skull base olfactory groove meningioma resected by another uh, physician. But you could see the tumor has recurred and it's recurred into the sinonasal cavity. So meningiomas can frequently recur into the nose. And so since it's primarily in the nose, uh, we came in endoscopically. We drilled out the whole cribriform plate here, as you can see, and uh, resected the dura here. And so uh, you can see here's a complete removal. This is all packing with the... Um, uh, mirror cell packing. You can see the defect extends from orbit to orbit. And uh, here's the uh, repair. So this was a gross total removal. So how do we relieve that tension? I mentioned uh, sometimes you pull this nasoceptal flap and it's under tension and it wants to pull backwards. And look at the long reach. You have to reach all the way to the front, but you have all this unused surface area. This surface area that extends across the sphenoid sinus. So I call this, this segment the sphenoidal segment. And we can make a relaxing sphenoidal slit incision right along the um, flap. And what it does, it releases the flap and it allows us to increase our anterior reach of the flap so there's no longer tension and then with this redundant flap that we have, we can now rotate it upwards to make contact with the planum sphenoidale. So you increase the surface area, not only anteriorly, but also posteriorly, and the tension is released. And um, we then pack the uh, flap with uh, surgicel, gel foam, and then a mirror cell pack. Okay. So here's an example of doing that relaxing slit incision. This is a 
uh, adenocarcinoma we removed. And uh, John, if you can mute all the uh, panelists, please. So okay. here, here is the um, here's the double layered alloderm. This defect was not very large, so we used double layered alloderm instead of the alloderm gasket. And then we put a little bit of surgical cell here. And now we'll rotate the nasal flap. So first we make the first release incision, which is along the coena. This is the standard you know, release incision to increase the reach of the flap. Uh, and then you'll see we'll bring the flap forward, but it doesn't quite make it to the frontal, the posterior table of the frontal sinus. We're bringing it forward and you can see there's this tension along the sphenoid segment of the flap. It's not really making any good contact. So we're gonna make a little oblique incision just uh, above the floor of the sphenoid sinus. And you do it incrementally. So you make a small little cut and then you interrogate it and see if that's gonna release the tension. If it doesn't, if it's not enough, you can do a little bit more. So we do it incrementally. And then we'll make a little more cut to release this tension. Being careful not to incise the pedicle. And so what that does is these release incisions allow us to mobilize the flap. You can see it's, it's a much more malleable flap now. You can see the pedicle is no longer under tension. It's actually laying down on the surface area of the nasal cavity. And look at the, the posterior margin of that flap. I call it the mud flap. It's like a mud flap on a truck. You can see how we can rotate it upwards to the planum sphenoidale. So now the, the flap makes great contact with the skull base. And um, we can now pack the flap with uh, uh, gel foam and um, inflate our mirror cell pack. So, you know, that's our repair. And uh, this is a, uh, three months out, look at the mucosalization of the flap. Beautiful reconstruction. Everything is healed very nicely. Uh, no CSF lead. So, so that's what that looks like. Um, we published this paper some years ago. Uh, our series at that point was 20 patients. And believe it or not, we didn't have any CSF leads using this technique. This is a very nice technique. Um, to repair the anterior skull base. So um, here you can see this is a, an example of an olfactory groove meningioma. This is a smaller one um, that was growing. Smell was impaired, but we did this uh, endoscopically through the nose. Here's some other examples of transcribiform approaches. This is a renal cell metastasis in the von Hippel Lindau's patient, a very rare, unusual tumor. We did this through an endoscopic and a nasal approach. You can see patient has a hemangioblastoma here at the craniosorbal junction that was treated at a later date that started growing. And uh, this was a difficult case. This was a cyanonasal neuroendocrine carcinoma. This was done purely endoscopic. Uh, there was a lot more frontal lobe invasion by the tumor. These are a lot more difficult. They can be more hemorrhagic. Um, and uh, here's an esthesioneuroblastoma. This esthesioneuroblastoma was uh, completely removed. You can see here is the reconstruction of the uh, skull base, beautiful mucosalization. We, typ we typically like to see this uh, delayed enhancement of the flap, and um, this enhancement is the, is the flap, it's not the tumor. So it's very important to study these MRIs. And it's very important to uh, uh, interact with your radiologist so they can also learn the imaging findings of nasal septal flaps and don't mistake in it for any tumor recurrence. And then this is a uh, 
inverted papilloma that recurred and became a squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, and then this was treated entirely uh, with endoscopic transcribiform resection as well. So we talked about the reconstruction, the triple layer reconstruction. And, um, you know, oftentimes I get asked, well, do you do any kind of buttress or a structural rigid reconstruction of this big defect? I mean, I'm worried about brain sag. Don't you need to put a structural reconstruction? So we actually tried to answer that question and we published this study where uh, we took a line and we drew the line from the nasion to the bottom of the cella, assuming the cella was not expanded. And this was sort of our imaginary average line of the anterior skull base. And what we did was we looked at to see if the repair had any sag or not. And what we found was that you had some patients that had a little bit of sag, but not by much, a few millimeters. The delta was 3.9 millimeters, which is very minimal. And then you had some patients who would actually retract upwards above that line. And uh, in the end, there was really no significant frontal lobe descent after doing a triple layer repair. So we didn't have any issues of encephalocele or brain sag. But it's important to talk about our limitations. Certainly this, this approach is not without its limitations. So you need to know the limits and how to overcome the limits and when to use an open approach or a combined approach. And so usually it's large tumors like this with wide extension, involvement of the orbit and brain invasion it's just much easier to do an open approach. Uh, in my opinion, it's faster and you, you actually have less blood loss because you're working faster and more efficient. Uh, so this is an example. This was a recurrent atypical meningioma, uh, very invasive. Uh, we did this through a combined approach where we come in transbasal from above and then endonasal from below. This is the combined approach. Uh, here's an example of a combined approach. This is a sinonasal teratocarcinosarcoma, very aggressive tumor. You can see there's some brain edema and shift. So we do a transbasal approach from above. Here's the approach from above where we open the dura. We take out the tumor in the frontal lobe, and then we cut out the dura and suture it so we get our repair of the intracranial cavity. And once you do this, you've isolated the intracranial cavity, you've protected it, and the rest of the tumor is removed uh, either from above or from below. And so here we, we've we drilled out the cribriform plate here actually from above. And you can do this very efficiently, very quickly. It's much faster. And, uh, and then you come in from below for the rest of it. There's usually tumor that's hidden anteriorly that you don't see from, from the approach from above and you can look into the maxillary sinuses from below as well. So if you do a combined approach, you can do what's called the double flap technique. So that's where you use a pericranial flap from above. And then if the nasal septal flap has not been compromised by the tumor, you can use a nasal septal flap from below. And these two flaps actually complement each other because the, strong, the strongest component of the pericranial flap is from the anterior portion, and the weakness where it leaks tends to be posteriorly. And complementarily, the nasal septal flap seals the posterior portion uh, better, and the weak point is the anterior margin of the flap. So these two flaps tend to complement each other. And if you have two layers of vascularity, uh, this tends to be belts and suspenders if the patient is to undergo radiation therapy where you fear that there may be radiation necrosis. So here's the example. This is the flap from above. This is the flap from below, the double flap repair. And here's the post-op scan. You can see a complete removal, double flap repair, uh, no CSF leak on this case. Here's another case. We did a combined approach. This is an anesthesioneuroblastoma, double flap repair, pericranial flap from above, nasal septal flap from below. 
Here's a recurrent meningioma. Again, we did this uh, combined cranial nasal approach. And here's the post-op scan. You can see uh, uh, this was a near total removal. There was some tumor adherent to the optic nerve we had to leave behind. And uh, here's another example. This was a, uh, a sinonasal malignancy, a uh, big tumor, combined repair. This is a anesthesio neuroblastoma. Here's a, uh, a recurrent uh, meningioma. You can see this, this is recurred and it's really involving the uh, frontal bone. Look at the tumor here invading into the frontal bone. So here you really have to do an approach from above. This is the tumor. Look how widely attached it is. It's invading into the frontal bone here. We drilled off the frontal bone and uh, went into the cribriform uh, sinonasal cavity and then did the repair uh, uh, from above. We sutured a watertight graft from above. And in these recurrent meningiomas, there's really no pericranial flap. The pericranial flap was used already in the previous surgery by the other surgeons. So you really need a way of reconstruction. And here we did a salvage nasal septal flap from below uh, to complete the repair. Um, this is a uh, recurrent grade two meningioma. Look at the proptosis here, very aggressive tumor. You can see her uh, right eye is proptotic, being pushed downwards. And so you have to do an approach from above. Uh, we can resect the tumor that's in the orbit. Uh, it's invading into the periorbital fat. We separate the tumor from the orbit. And now we're left with this huge defect there's no pericranial flap. What's our exit strategy? Well, we're going to suture the alloderm to the bone, and we're going to suture the alloderm to the edge of the uh, dura on the inside. So we do all that, and then we suture the alloderm uh, on the convexity. And then from below, this is our, our alloderm. You can see our alloderm pulsating from below. And so we need vascularized tissue here. So we're going to use our nasoceptal flap. And you can see the flap is having trouble reaching the front. It's under a bit of tension. And so we're going to make our release maneuvers. There's generally two release maneuvers. The first release is along the arc of the coena. And this allows you to rotate the root of that flap. And then now we make our sphenoidal relaxing slit incision just above the floor of the sphenoid sinus. You can see here's the slit incision. Now we have that mud flap that we can rotate upwards up against the planum sphenoidale. And look at the flap. This flap is so robust and it's going uh, well anterior to the margin of the defect. We'll then bolster it with some Surgicel and then uh, some gel foam. And then we'll inflate uh, several mirror cell packs here to put pressure on that flap. And we leave this in for about 10 to 12 days uh, before our ENT colleagues take them out in the office. So look at the reduction of the proptosis. You can see the eyes in much better position. Fortunately, she did not have a CSF leak and she had a very nice reconstruction. So what are our, what are our limitations? If the dural extension goes lateral, there's a lot of orbital hyperostatic uh, uh, features. Again, these patients have higher risk of CSF leak. And I think vascular encasement is important. If you have vascular encasement, you probably should not do an approach from below. Because if you get a vascular injury, it's very difficult to repair these endoscopically. It's very hard to put any suture to repair vessels. It's much easier to do this uh, with an open approach with the head wide open. So vascular encasement, I generally use an approach from above. And if there's hydrocephalus, beware. Hydrocephalus is a setup for a CSF leak if you're doing it purely endonasal without any CSF diversion. So 
have that consideration. Um, for these big meningiomas, I like an open approach. I think open approach is more effective. Uh, my, you can do these many ways. I like the modified extended transbasal approach. Gets me right down to the anterior skull base. Oftentimes, there's, you don't need to retract. The tumor has done the work for you by creating the corridor. And uh, in this case, the tumor was eroding through the ethmoid cavities. We had to drill out the cribriform plate. And here we've done a, a repair with an alloderm, uh, followed by a pericranial flap, and then a watertight closure of the uh, dural defect and uh, a, a nice repair. So this was a complete removal, uh, and the patient did well, uh, was neurologically intact. Here's another example. This was a large planum olfactory meningioma, huge tumor. Uh, again, extended, modified one piece extended transbasal approach. We incorporate the anterior wall of the frontal sinus. Here's the tumor. Here's the pericolosal arteries, the A2s. And this was a, a nice complete removal. Uh, and the patient did great. This one is a very aggressive tumor. This was a uh, atypical grade two meningioma. You can see it extends from almost one convexity to the other side. It's very multi-lobulated, multi-lobulated tumor. Uh, and this was a, a complete removal. And uh, uh, what I want to dispel the myths of is uh, an open approach can be done safely and the patients can have great outcome and even a great cosmetic result. So not everything has to be done in the nasal. This is uh, my series of olfactory groove meningiomas. I think we're up to close to 40 cases now, but uh, the repair is great. And, you know, the role for endoscopic for olfactory groove is still controversial. If you look at the meta-analysis, the gross total resection rates are, are, are lower for endonasal, and the CSF leak rate is higher. And, of course, olfaction is almost 100% because you drill out the cribriform plate, you're eliminating olfaction. But with the transcranial approach in select cases, if patients still have remaining olfaction, you can still have a chance of preserving it. So um, again, CSF leak rate for endonasal is much higher. The tumors that are larger than four centimeters have increased complications. Uh, and um, so, so it's important to know all approaches. For olfactory groove meningiomas, we use all approaches. We use transbasal, for large ones and for smaller ones that still have olfaction, we come from above. If they've lost olfaction and the tumors are smaller, we come from below. And uh, for recurrences like this that incorporate both, we use a combined approach for some of these. And um, you can refer to our paper. This is our series. Um, and you can see it's pretty comparable to the uh, uh, systematic review. And um, in general, um, our extent of resection, we settle for near total if, um, if there's tumor adherence to the optic nerve or a, a anterior cerebral artery to avoid complication. Um, our complications included uh, one bone flap infection and pneumocephalus, frontal sinusitis. In one of our endonasal cases, we had a hematoma. Uh, with a delayed abscess that was treated medically and one case of a, a CSF leak that unfortunately resulted in mortality. So um, very important. Um, so I think the pendulum has swung to a, a medium uh, to not to go big. Um, when should we consider endonasal for olfactory? Um, the smaller medium-sized tumor where the olfaction is already impaired and this is a case of that uh, that case where we did a complete removal and a neurologically intact patient. And for a tumor like this, which I showed you earlier, uh, olfaction was already impaired, and this was a complete removal. 
Uh, so if the smell is intact, uh, why would you do an endonasal and impair their olfaction when you can do an approach from above, get a complete removal and spare the olfaction? So try to spare the olfaction. Um, I think olfaction is an important function. So in conclusion, the endoscopic endonasal transcribiform approach is viable approach for benign and malignant anterior skull base tumors. Meticulous repair using the triple layer repair and a nasal septal flap using the relaxing slit incision I showed you can be a very effective way of minimizing CSF leak. Again, patient selection is very important to get successful outcomes. If you choose the wrong patient for the approach, you don't set yourself up for success. You set yourself up for problems and complications. And so be ready to use a combined approach Combined approaches are great. They're very effective. They complement each other, especially for these large tumors that invade the brain. Yeah, you know, you get wider exposure, you get a better tumor removal. There's less time in the OR. It's very fast and efficient. And then you also have multiple options of reconstruction. You have a pericranial flap, a nasoceptal flap, or maybe even both. So uh, with that, uh, uh, I thank my team. Uh, uh, Anderson Eloy and company for uh, uh, their work. And uh, thank you for attention. Thank you very much, James. Uh, and we have Harshad uh, Parekh, who's going to moderate. He's an Indian neurosurgeon from uh, Mumbai. He practices at the same hospital as the tool go well. Welcome, Harshad. It's better than a neurosurgeon moderate. Hi, James. Hi, John. Welcome, Harshad. Thank you. Hi, James. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing fine. And yourself? I'm good. Another great master lecture. And I'm following you in every lecture. And wonderful job you are doing. And anterior skull base approaches, endoscopically, as well as the transcranial and combined approaches. Wonderfully shown all these cases. And I think you have achieved a lot of mastery now in repairing the anterior skull base endoscopically. And uh, the most important part of the endo endoscopic anterior skull base is the prevention of a CSF leak. That is the biggest problem. And uh, I've read your paper in Neurosurgical Focus about repair, three layer inlay, and uh, wonderfully done. I just wanted to know when you are repairing the intracranial fossa from the nose and uh, when you feel everything is being tight, watertight, do you give Valsalva maneuver to see whether there is leakage of CSF? Yeah, so I think the important principle is before, before you put the flap up, you really need to have zero to very minimal you know, seepage of CSF. Otherwise the flap is under too much pressure. It's probably going to fail. So, you know, usually we, you know, we do a triple layer repair. So we, the inlay, we initially put a, either a, a fascia lata or an alloderm inlay first. And then we do a second layer, you know, with the, the gasket and the gasket is good. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a gel foam gasket with an alloderm and it really creates like a napkin ring kind of a plug. So the CSF pulsation doesn't push it out. And uh, if it's a small defect, we just put two layers of alloderm, a little bit of surgicel. And then if there's still like some leakage or seepage, you can, there's a couple of tricks we've been doing lately. Sometimes we put a little bit of fat to seal off any little cracks. And, and nowadays we're using taco seal. Taco seal is a very nice, um, uh, fibrin sealant that's on a gel foam or on a collagen carrier and it's like scotch tape you know I, it's like you can use it like scotch tape and I tape the sides of the defect and you hold a little pressure and that that really creates a good watertight seal and then we rotate the flap and uh, the other trick you should do is when you're doing the repair put the patient in reverse Trendelenburg and sit the patient up because that lowers the CSF pressure so that when you're repairing it, it's not wanting to push the repair out 
because if you have the head flat and the patient is a little bit heavier with a high BMI, uh, it tends to want to push the CSF pressure out. How many days you give bed rest after the repair? I don't give them bed rest. I try to get them walking as soon as possible. So, you know, there's the Italian paper by uh, Domenico Solari about the three Fs. It's um, fat, flap, and fast. So what that means is they, they like to repair with fat and then a nasoceptal flap, and they want to get the patient out of bed fast, which means the sooner you get up and walk, the lower the CSF pressures and the lower the CSF leak rate. When you repair, when you do combined approach, you do at the same sitting or you come again? I do it in the same sitting. Which meningiomas you would not like to do transnasal? Uh, the big ones. Big ones. <laughs> Most of my meningiomas, I would say a great 95% of them are transcranial. Most of these right. ones that I, I treat are, are huge, greater than four centimeters. A lot of frontal lobe edema, involvement of the ACAs. So you really need a open approach to carefully dissect those structures out. Yeah. For a neuroblastoma or esthesioblastoma, do you radiate the patient post-op? Yes. For sinonasal malignancies, we you know typically present them in tumor board. Um, and the general recommendation has been uh, radiation with or without chemotherapy, depending on the, the tumor type. Any recurrent, any CSF leak you get, you repair immediately? Yeah, you know, um, if we see a CSF leak, uh, I generally like to take them back and, and re-explore them and repair them as opposed to putting a lumbar drain in for three or five days. I, I just think, um, you know, if it's uh, if it's a clear leak, it's I, I prefer to just take them back and repair it. Very nice demonstration, wonderfully shown. You've got amazing technique, no doubt about it. I must congratulate you and your team, superbly done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to I acknowledge you. Go ahead, go ahead. I don't see any questions uh, except a few good comments. Okay, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Jorge Salazar, leading neurosurgeon from Ecuador. Jorge, do you want to say hello to James? Uh, good morning, uh, James. Morning, uh, an excellent lecture. Uh, you have given us uh, the appropriate approach from above and below. Perhaps the question I would like to ask you is, what is the role of the exoscope on these surgeries, either from above or below? Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, I have very limited experience with exoscope. And quite honestly, um, I've used the exoscope in demonstrations and cadaver labs. And um, I think it's a nice visualization tool. It um, The advantages, in my opinion, seems to be that, um, and at least the way the companies uh, exhibit it, is to say that it gives your audience in the room a more immersive experience because it generally has a nice high definition, sometimes a 3D monitor. Um, and it has more, you know, depths of field. Um, I do think that when you're operating, it, it is a little bit different. Um, you do have to train your body to know where your hands are in space. Whereas with a microscope, if you're a microscopic surgeon, it be, it's more natural. You kind of know spatially where your hands are. And, um, you know, so does it, the question is, does it give you more advantage and can, does it give you better ability to perform the surgery you need to perform with a microscope or an endoscope? And I, 
I don't know the answer to that. I mean, and, and, you know, don't change something that works for you is my, my message. But if it works for you and it gives you a better advantage, then you should explore it. Thank you, James. Um, one more question. Uh, can you be more specific or repeat again? What are your limits from the law, the lateral limits uh, to perform these surgeries? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, many people have tried to look at this um, anatomically or even in their clinical experience. You know, it's been said that you can resect the superior orbit as wide as the meridian of the globe of the orbit. And I think while you can do that technically, um, you know, I, I, I that's not my preference. I, um, I will drill uh, all the way up to the uh, lamina propitia and, um, you know, I'll drill off more bone if I need to. But in general, I feel that if you resect, if you make your defect wider, and you cut the dura wide, um, you just have a higher risk of CSF leakage because you need something to tuck under. I mean, the whole idea of the repair that we do from below is that it relies on the ability to tuck tissue on a ledge of bone and to wedge tissue on ledges of bone. Um, so um, my preference is that if the tumor goes wide, you know, beyond the, the first quarter or third of the medial orbit, uh, I have a low threshold to either come from above or do a, a combined approach. Thank you, James. James. Do you... Thanks again sorry, for the sorry. great yeah, lecture. Yeah. James, do you use any bone graft ever? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I tried to address that uh, earlier. Um, we, we don't use any structural reconstruction for endoscopic transcribiform. Um, you know, we, we generally don't use a bone graft. We just use soft tissue repair. And we have not seen any brain sag or encephalocele formation. So great job. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, any more questions or comments from the? Oh, okay, Ibrahima, go ahead. Hi, Mr. John, and uh, thanks, doc uh, Dr. Liu. Uh, it was, was a great lecture. Uh, it was always great experience to follow in your lecture all time. Uh, one of my questions I've already asked, so I'm going to ask the second one. If there any involvement with the ICA injury, do you always often uh, refer the patient to the vascular surgeon, or you, how did you manage usually the ICA uh, injured? Great question. Um, ICA injury is, uh, if you've ever experienced it, it's um, it's it's quite an unbelievable experience because it, it's like a fire hydrant that's you know, splashing out at you under high pressure. And, you know, it's a very precarious situation to be in because one, you have to control your emotions and you have to control your, maintain your focus and maintain your, 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 maintain your calmness and your coolness so that you can get the patient um, safely out of the operating room. So the first thing you have to do is you have to breathe, okay? First, you have to like breathe and then you have to say, okay, I have a problem here and I got to be ready to fix it. So you right. must have a good, you must have a good assistant. You have to have a good, you know, ENT colleague or, or assistant holding the scope because that scope is going to be blinded with blood. And you need to have a high, you need to have your suctions working. If your suction is not working, it is a disaster. So hopefully you have good nurses in the room. You have a backup suction. You have a large bore, 10 French, 12 French suction. And so the first thing you have to do is you have to plug 
you have to plug the the site of the bleeding so that you don't drop your blood pressure and go into cardiac arrest. If you lose too much blood too quickly in blood volume, the, the patient is dead. So you have to stop the bleeding. And usually, you know, we pack it off with cottonoid patties. And you should just pack, you should just pack the, the nose with cottonoid, stabilize the pressure, call for blood, give blood transfusion, tell the anesthesiologist what the problem is so they understand what's going on. You want to stabilize the patient so they don't lose their blood pressure. Okay. So now at that point, once you've packed things off, it's like putting a finger on the, the dike where it's leaking and, and you just have to hold pressure there. And while you're doing that, your, your assistant can harvest some muscle in the, um, harvest some muscle in either the belly or the leg. And then you can crush the muscle so that it's, um, it's like a crushed, you know, graft. And this is the difficult part. Now, you if you have the bleeding all controlled, now you got to take all the packing out and the, start the bleeding again and then push the crushed muscle over the site of the injury. And that can be challenging and that that can result in, you know, not a great experience also. But if you're able to somehow slide the muscle over the bleeding point and then pack it again, now you have tissue that's covering the, the, the side of the hole. If that doesn't work, just leave the packing in. Just leave the packing in. And then the next step is while this is all happening, you have an assistant who's calling. Hopefully you, you have in your hospital an interventionalist or an endovascular person. And you need to take the patient to the angiogram suite so they can do an angiogram Obviously, it's going to have a pseudo aneurysm in that side of the bleeding point in the carotid. And at that point, you have a couple of options. You're going to see a pseudo aneurysm, no doubt. You can either put a stent and preserve flow to the carotid, or you have to take down the carotid by coil occluding the carotid segment and pray that the patient tolerates it and doesn't get a stroke. If you occlude it, that stops the bleeding and you don't have to worry about delayed hemorrhage. If you do a stent, the patient needs to be on aspirin and Plavix and the hole is not fixed. It's, it's being diverted, but the hole still has, um, you know, this, the hole still... <laughs> It still is not repaired. So um, you have cotton in the nose. And uh, at some point you have to perhaps go back and, you know, put some tissue over it if you haven't. And um, so it's, uh, that's sort of, you know, our, our protocol of, of doing that uh, handling IC injury. Okay. Thank you, Professor James for this question. Uh, my second question is going to be uh, a few data. Uh, usually in your department, the approach is doing by using the holder or by two uh, with the assistant going to hold the endoscope or you do like both. So the approach is generally done by my ENT colleague, um, Dr. Eloy or Dr. Shea. And for these approaches, Generally, there's tumor, you know, these are mostly sinonasal cancers, but yeah, there's usually tumor in the nasal cavity. They will open up the appropriate sinuses depending on the location of the tumor, and they'll debulk the tumor, you know, up to the cribriform plate. And then we come in with a binostral approach to drill the cribriform, cut out the dura, and then do the reconstruction together. So that's that's generally the steps of, of how we do it. Okay. Because uh, in our department, actually, we, we usually for, we have like uh, endoscopic teams. We usually don't cooperate with the ENT doctor. We did always the approach by the neurosurgeon. So it's quite a huge department of endoscopic surgery. 
So, and uh, the other question was about the, um, the lumbar drainage. Usually when you have like a big effect, like we explained recently about uh, when the brain is pushing up, you already pack all of that to control the pressure. Do you often do like lumbar drainage for a few days just to let the brain relax or just you don't always have that experience for yourself? Yeah, that's a, you know, I do use lumbar drain, but not for cribiform. For cribiform, we've shied away from lumbar drain. We do use lumbar drain for transplanum or transclival, but for cribiform, the defect is so big and we rely on the weight of the frontal lobe to compress the grafts, the inlay grafts that, um, you know, we shied away from lumbar drain. We just feel that lumbar drain will decrease the CSF pressures too much and, and um, your repair is not going to work as well. And you have the risk of the negative pressure sucking up air, causing tension pneumocephalus. Okay, and uh, so thank you for this old answer. And I'm sorry for many many questions. The other question is just about the what did you think about the beginner for endoscopic surgery? Do you recommend him to have like all the set of the endoscopic, like zero degree, thirty degree, thirty forty degree, all of that? Do you recommend all of that to the beginner or? only the zero degree should be enough for like a departure for all endoscopic approach. What did you think about that? <laughs> I think you should, I think you should have all the different uh, clubs in your set, you know, like a golf club, you know, you want your driver, your putter, your wedge, and you need all that stuff because, um, and it's and you had to learn. You need to learn how to use a angled endoscope because when you're doing a transcribiform, your view is much more uh, spectacular with a thirty degree looking upwards. You get a beautiful panoramic view. A zero degree gives you a very limited view of what you need to see, and uh, you know you need visualization is is key. You need to you need to learn how to use an angled scope how to work with your assistant on where to position your suction in the same nostril with the scope, depending on which direction it's looking. There's a lot of nuance to that. And if you're not familiar with that, when you're when it's time to use an ang angled scope, you can get lost. So you should develop that experience early. Um, and in fact, we, we train our residents to use a 30 degree scope as our go-to endoscope we we rarely use a zero degree that's largely influenced by my my ent team because that's that's how they were trained okay thank you professor james for this wonderful lecture we always learn a lot from you and it was really uh, amazing lecture and so knowledgeable thank you again for for this lecture thank you so much uh, Ibrahim, you're from you're in china correct Yes, I'm in China. I'm in uh, Huashan Hospital, actually. Well, welcome again. Yes, I'm in Huashan Hospital. I'm still in, uh, actually, I'm in the skull base team. I've mm -hmm. been in both, like the endoscopic team and also the open surgery uh, skull base. Do you speak, quite, uh, do you speak Mandarin or do you speak Mandarin or Shanghainese? Uh, I speak both now, slowly. I'm just trying my best to, at least to say most of the word, at least in Chinese, because I don't need any translator during my surgery now. <laughs> and wh where is your original country of origin? I'm from Guinea, West Africa. Oh. Guinea Conakry. Excellent. You guys yes. are amazing, learning neurosurgery and another language. <laughs> that, is, that is truly incredible. It's quite a, a, a lot of challenge to really learn another language like that. It's quite interesting. <laughs> it is interesting. I've learned a few words on uh, like like the muscle graft, uh, Jiro. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Jiro, yes. <laughs> uh, or Gigi, like the fat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very yes. good. Very yes. good. Thank you, Professor James. Uh, any more questions or comments from the panel?
there is one question in q and a by carlos regarding saying the timing of the starting radiotherapy gms yeah uh radiotherapy for the sinonasal malignancies we try to do it um, as soon as possible as um you know if there's no leak we we try to go as early as 3 weeks post op we don't want to delay radiation sometimes these tumors they start to grow back if you wait too long one more question james uh from roman eliuk thank you for a great lecture quite often in ogm we find a feeding branch from anterior the anterior cerebral artery these feeders are easily controlled with transcranial approach what would you recommend for these feeding vessels to be done through eea yeah great question i when the tumors start to recruit vessels from the ACA, those are generally big tumors, greater than four or five centimeters with a lot of edema. I generally don't treat those tumors with EEA. Um, my preference is it's safer to do transcranial approach, as you mentioned, and that's been my preference for these giant tumors. I think it's safer it's faster and there's low lower risk of complication very good okay that's all the questions we have thanks for all your time james uh and i'd just like to mention that we have following this program in about one hour we have a topic that um uh, jorge salazar was alluding to uh use of the exascope uh, that i'm sure is going to go over uh, series. Uh, he's going to talk about the exoscope, endoscope, and ergonomics, if you're interested. Uh, okay, other than that, James, I uh, thank you very much for a great interactive session, and we look forward to number four of your second series uh, of the uh, Art of Brain Surgery Masterclass. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Okay. Thank you. Adios. Thank you. Stop recording. Okay, stop.